spy city. A dangerous city, where nothing is what it seems to be, and the people here are not who they seem to be. The Double Cross is not only a game, but the norm. Staying alive is survival. Staying sane is a necessity. Blackout City Shooting Junior by E.S. Wynn the gun barks. Jimmy's face separates, spreads itself against the wall behind him. My hand leads the gun back to the door. Ten more goons, faceless, hopped up on grunt, straight from the boards. Ten more rounds, ten more meaty stains across fading, peeling wallpaper, the cracked door jam. Ten more bodies for Blackout City Morgue. I have no memory of this house, this part of town. I watch myself, somehow distant, as the gasoline hits the floor, spills across walls, runs into and through the sticky crimson fingering through rotting carpet. When the can is empty, I light a cigarette, take a couple of puffs, toss it into the pile of corpses as I leave. Another blast of morphodrill and I'm on the street again, hiding my twisting face until it settles into something solid, something different from the face I wore on the way in. The gun goes in a dumpster just outside the already crackling shack. Stupid, real stupid, but beyond my control. Whatever this is. Dream. Memory. It always unfolds the same way. By the time the pigs arrive, I'm gone. A shadow among shadows. No witnesses. No one for goons or the man to butcher, beat, or question. But I know they'll find the gun. Lift the prince. I know they'll trace the whole thing back to me, pin the murders on me. I've seen all this before, lived it, and every time it feels more real than the last. My body is mine, but only distantly, the part that runs, that heads for the happy outlook. That has ideas about meeting Morty, trading the package and going underground for a while, it moves within me, drags me along through all this. All I can do is hold on, watch it all again, live it all again, know that whatever hell I'll be shucked into on the other side has got to be brighter than this comedy of errors. In the distance, something goes up with a rolling boom, startles me enough to make me look back. The papers will talk of ruptured gas lines tomorrow. The drug lab I didn't know was there until after I'd burnt it to the ground. They'll talk of bodies found in the ruins, charred, unrecognizable, faceless, all except for one, Joseph Pratt's eldest son. That's what does it, what lands me in hot water faster than anything else. That's what triggers the manhunt, the fervor driving the pigs and the mob of reporters and the would-be soldiers of fortune that will come looking, thinking they can pull a gun on Joe Smoke and make a few easy bucks to drop on black market happy pills. Joe Pratt Jr., the media sob story, the inspiring martyr of addiction and recovery cut short suddenly by a bullet from the gun of a private detective with no face. He was getting better, the mother will sob, and the headlines will soak it up like so much blood, printed as boldly as the rest of the lies that hit white paper with black eyes of ink. Joe Pratt Jr. wasn't getting any better. His dad's money couldn't buy enough rehab to knock him back onto the straight and narrow, and that was never going to change, even had he lived. But the media will never care about that. They want heroes, stories of beach-brown surfer boys like Pratt, who brush against the hard stuff, bought him out quick, and then come back to be politicians, men of money, success, learning, men who can keep the legal drugs flowing, keep the wars going. I'd cut that story short, made it a tragedy, and now it was my turn to be the villain. But in this stretch of the vision, Joe Pratt Jr. is the farthest thing from my mind. I've got no reason to think about him. No reason to believe he was one of the grunt-shooting goons whose brains I cleaned with a lead Q-tip. Old man Pratt isn't even on my radar. Another wealthy haunch in a corner office with his fingers in the government. We're worlds apart. Literally. At least, for another few hours. 
I reach the happy outlook after too long on the streets. The sirens are distant now, only come here and there when an emergency vehicle leaves, goes rushing across asphalt toward the burning house. The air is already thickening with oily smoke, makes me cough as I push my way through the door of the diner, shoulder my way past gossiping Soma heads to the corner table I'm supposed to meet Morty at. Only Morty isn't there, no one is, and it isn't like Morty to be late, not for a deal like this, not for something this important. I hesitate for only an instant, sit down even though I know it's another stupid move, another nail in the coffin. The diner is full of witnesses that will place me here when certain interested parties come looking later. The waitress walks up, takes my order. Coffee. Black. Two eggs. Bacon. I wait fifteen minutes. No Morty. No eggs. No coffee. No bacon. I'm getting antsy. I know something's wrong. The smoke outside thickens. Ten more minutes of nothing and I leave. Make sure to drop some cash on the table for the waitress before I go. I'll find Morty later. He wants the package. He'll be good for it later. Now, I've got to look out for number one. I hit the streets again, cover my face, and breathe through my coat as I shuffle eastward. Can't go back to the office. Risk someone catching me there. Someone from the boards. Someone under the thumb of the man. Maybe pigs. The pressure is on, but not as hot as it'll get by morning. Best to lay low, wait and see what happens from a hotel room near the boards, right under the noses of the people I've pissed off. Wouldn't be the first time, probably not the last. Faceless hookers show leg as advertisements I cross Hughes Street to book a room at the last tequila, drop cash for a week, knowing I'll probably use it. The whores watch me as I pay, make a show of their interest, but they're not the kind of comfort I'm looking for. A few extra bucks convinces the guy at the desk to lock up for a few, fetch me a pile of blue ribbons, and enough whiskey to keep me lubricated for the length of my stay. I'm almost blind drunk when Joe Pratt Jr.'s face rises out of the snow of some static-eaten news report to glare accusingly at me like some vengeful ghost. In minutes, that ghost is on every channel, and then they find the gun. I'm too blotto to do anything but stare pass out with the lights and smoke and fire and sirens of the news watching me. When the sun finally burns my eyes awake, old man Pratt is resolutely holding back tears, addressing a bristling hedgehog of handheld microphones, talking about the good times with Junior, about how close they were, about progress cut short. And then I hear my name, see the entrance to my office staked out by pigs, Lily being led away in handcuffs. Money makes the law work fast, and if there's anything old man Pratt has, it's money. I stare slack-jawed at the screen, fighting the thunderstorm of a hangover, until I hear someone crash through the bedroom window. I panic, dive off the bed, reach for the pocket in my coat. No gun. Threw it in the dumpster. Bad move, Joe. In another handful of seconds, I hear the bathroom door, wedge my shoulder under the edge of the bed, and throw all of my strength into it, driving it toward whoever's come for me. I hear the bark of a shotgun, see the springing explosion of wire and fluff that erupts from one end of the bed, and then I feel the mattress hit meat, feel the ineffectual way it knocks the would-be assassin backwards, hardly stuns him. Another goon comes through the front window, then, gets caught up in the curtains long enough for me to jump him, smash him against a nearby wall, send his head into a nightstand. Hands snap up the package I have for Morty, and then I'm gone, sprinting into the street, half-blind, shaking with adrenaline, with the pain. I'm faceless again, my meds abandoned in my rush to get away, and everything hurts like hell. Stupid decisions pile up. And then I'm lost in the boards, pushing my way along the walls of alleys, desperate for options, finding none. Twice I think I hear someone chasing me, but nothing shows, no one comes. Pain spreads, becomes almost crippling. And then I round a corner to find myself in open sunlight again, face to face with a squad of pigs. I don't fight. Don't want to get lasered into hamburger. Going with the pigs, letting them cuff me and drag me in for justice, is the first smart choice I make, the only smart choice, in this twisted vision. 
Cameras, flashes, and microphones meet me when I'm pushed out of the patrol car and led into the station. Ugly men and women demanding answers, asking me what drove me to murder poor innocent Junior. Was I in a gang, they ask? Did Junior want out? Was I jealous of his recovery, his rise toward a better life? I offer the closest thing to a grin my featureless face can forge, but say nothing. It's all I can do, and in another moment I'm inside, thrown through the whole rigmarole of processing, of questioning, of dirty looks, disgusted glares. Never once do I see old man Pratt, but I know he's there, behind one-way glass, maybe watching through some static-eaten CCTV display. He's too rich, too snowed by Junior's good son facade not to be. Money dragged me into this. Money made the analysis quick. The catch quicker, quick enough to make me think, maybe, somewhere, somehow, I'd been set up. Lots of people want me dead, and as money pushes me through the legal system to the edge of death row, to a quick and quiet execution, lots of people get their wish. When the vision ends, I'm in the chair, scalp moistened, iron cap snug against my featureless skull. Money clears the way, puts the switch in Pratt's hand. My skin stretches in some shade of a grin as he pulls it, and the last thing I see are his blind tears, tears wasted, spilled for a sun that never existed, an illusion, a sweet dream wrapped tight around the corpse of a real, worthless son of a bitch. Breath comes deep, slow. If my story had ended there, in darkness, I might have found some happiness, but always... In that moment, as several thousand volts of electricity eat into my muscles, my bones shove me into darkness, I come out the other side riding a wave of something resembling peace, something like the high of a handful of blue ribbons. Still seated, I wake up in my office, hat dipping over my eyes, the sound of a fan mixing with Lily's laugh, her half of some phone conversation that comes only as mumbles, happy sounds, sharp sounds. The sounds of women gossiping. Sitting up, I lean forward, let the fog of sleep drift out of my mind, give my eyes some time to gather focus again. The vision, memory, whatever you want to call it, it always ends this way, always leaves me in my office, sticks in my brain like shards of sleepwalking dreams while I recover, work my way through the rest of a day just like the rest, subtly different, another stone in the endless river of time. As I always do, as I always have, I check my coat, find my gun there, clip full, cold and quiet, not lost, not discarded or caught in plastic or held up in a courtroom as evidence. The package I'm supposed to give Morty is always still in the desk, third drawer down, under a dozen folders of loose research on Joseph Pratt and Junior I never planned to look at. I've never delivered it, never opened it have only ever wondered in passing what might be in it. Morty's never asked me for it, and part of me feels that perhaps that's for the best. Just another shard of a dark dream, something better left untouched, unexplored. The moon is full and it is dripping with blood. Now comes Blood Moon Rising magazine. Original fiction. Creature features. Nightmarish artwork. Interviews and other original horror. Visit bloodmoonrisingmagazine.com and join our rising legion. I see images shift from shadow to light. I hear voices in a swirling vacuum. Memory dissolves and then forms again. These are stories I believe to come from my files, but I'm not sure. I hear a dominant female voice, Lily. She tells me it's just a bad trip. Jordan in the Time of Cold War by Seth Hartwood This was before I got straightened out, back when I was running ragged on the Lower East Side, doing whatever I could to get by. I was betting heavy on NBA games, trying not to piss away what little I had. 
Mostly, I did favors for a guy named Joe S. Whatever he needed. He started me out small, but before I knew it, he had me doing dirty, busting guys up when they didn't have his money, things like that, and sometimes worse. The first time I ever came down hard on one of Joe's deadbeats, I pictured someone else doing the same to me, almost like I could see it coming from not too far off. If things hadn't gone different, I would have wound up there, no doubt about it. But that's another story for a different time. What this is about is the one time I had to go out and leave this nice girl who claimed to love me to do something for Joe. Her name? We can call her Delilah. But if I said her real name, it's not like she'd care. She's in a better place now, with lots more going on than listening to my shit. Back then, we were both using whatever we could get our hands on. This week it'd be weed, next week coke or E or whatever. Put it up our nose, smoke it, shoot it, stick it in a vein. We didn't care, we did whatever. This particular week, she'd managed to score some opium, a black tar ball that smoked sweeter than weed, like cooking incense, nothing like hash. It didn't do anything particularly for me, but it felt cool to smoke, like I would wake up with amazing dreams. Delilah was real into the literature thing then, told me about these writers who'd smoked it back in the day and written crazy shit, guys with three names, like Coleridge and Langhorn and Tennyson. I might have been able to make something good with her, something that'd last, but back then I couldn't stop betting against the bulls. Sure, Jordan did it all, but I kept picking his luck to run out. An injury, Pippin getting a migraine, or Horace Grant punking out. Something. Of course, that never came. Instead, they kept rolling their way through games, playoff series, and titles. This was the decade when, if Jordan wasn't playing baseball, that's how it was. I was in the hole to Joe for enough that I didn't have an option to say no when he called, and I hadn't heard from Joe in a while, so I knew it was going to be bad. He called just after the first game of a Sunday triple header. I think the third game was Celtics and Knicks, so I was glad when he said he didn't need me until after ten. Even junked out, Delilah read the whole deal on my face as Joe talked into my ear. He wants you tonight, she said when I hung up. She had on a tight black tank that came down to her thighs. Not like I gave a shit about sex right then, with the games on and Joe's call, but she always had enough to make me stutter. So what is it, she asked. What do he ask you to do? He just asked, I said. What? You asked me like he didn't just say it. Like it's not something that's already happened. Bullshit. You don't have to do this. Like that, I was already making it a bigger problem. Things changed on me like that too easily back then. Part of the reason I went straight, I guess. Someone called in the middle of a fine Sunday afternoon and it made everything crazy. Just fucked up my whole world. Stands to reason Delilah could have done better. I guess you'd be better off not to know. Not to know you? What'd you say? She rolled over on the couch to face the wall. I was in the chair next to the phone and sitting close to the TV. If I wanted, I could have just turned up the volume again and gone back to watching. Barkley and Phoenix were getting ready to play Malone, Stockton, and the Jazz. I watched the announcer sitting on little stools in the middle of the court with players running layup lines behind them. Barkley was on his back, getting stretched out by a trainer. Fuck is wrong with doing a favor for Joe? Delilah didn't say anything. I watched her side rise up and down as she breathed. You know I owe him money. I know, she said. So go on and do whatever you're going to do. It's not till later. He doesn't need me now. I stood up and walked into the bedroom and shut the door. Barkley, Stockton, Delilah. They could all do without me, even the mailman, especially the mailman. It was technically her apartment, but when I first came in, I gave her the next two months' rent right up front, just like that, to let her know where I stood. Now I walked to her closet and bent down, looked in the back behind all her shoes at the typewriter case where I kept my few things, the ones worth any real money. The typewriter case had a lock with three numbers— I'd programmed them to 666 because I was smart like that. 
that's how much I wanted things to go well. Far as Delilah knew, I had just a typewriter in there, exactly like me to use one, me, the writer, but she believed it anyway, and so never touched the case. If she did, she'd know the weight wasn't right, and that she'd want to know what else was inside, something that wouldn't be good for either of us. In the case was my old man's thirty-eight, the one he taught me to shoot back in the alleyway behind our house. Bricks, bottles, beer cans. That's where I learned. Delilah would not have been good with me keeping a gun, not in the apartment or anywhere else. Another one of our differences. I opened the top and took out the actual typewriter, an ancient Remington where the whole carriage lifted up when you used shift. Underneath, wedged into the bottom under the keys, was the gun. I popped the cylinder and gave it a spin. Six bullets. The full load. If things went well, I'd only need one. But you never knew how things would go. Delilah tried the knob and then knocked. Why is this door locked? Just a minute. I didn't move to let her in. My eyelids felt tired, like someone had stolen the energy right out of me, taken away what was supposed to make me sit up straight and be in the world. I could hear the TV, an announcer talking about the starting lineups for the game. What's in there? Are you holding out on me? Is that... She was off onto something else, looking for the next big high. I'll be right there. After a few minutes, she gave up. I could hear the TV click off, and then the flick of our lighter. The handle of the thirty-eight had gone warm in my hand. I suppose that's what I wanted. I pushed the typewriter case back into the closet and tucked the gun into her dresser's top drawer, underneath what was left of my clean underwear. In the living room, she was on the love seat again, nodding off into her high. She looked up at me for a few seconds, then stopped. I wanted to turn the TV on again, but didn't. Instead, I lit a cigarette and went to the kitchen to make coffee. It was going to be a long night. Later, after the third game of the triple header had ended, my last bet drew me even on the day when the Celtics won. I went back into the bedroom and put the gun down the back of my pants. She was there when I turned. What's that? What? She cocked her head to the side and squinted. Jeff, do not start this shit with me. It's a gun. There, how about that? A gun? In my apartment? Something about the way she said it, taking full ownership for her place, pissed me off. I wanted to walk out right then, but knew I'd need her for an alibi later. You know, baby, just something I had to have on hand for that odd time. I was actually keeping it in a locker outside the apartment until yesterday. She tilted her head. I don't suppose either of us believed me. I definitely could have put more into selling the lie. She stayed quiet. I wanted her to go back in the other room, toot out on the opium again, and nod into a high. If we'd had something stronger that week, something like H or dust, this might have been a smaller problem. Know what? I asked her. What? I'm leaving. I grabbed my jacket off the chair and pushed past her out of the room. Good, she said. Good. I didn't stop in the living room, left my smokes on the coffee table next to the black chunk and kept going. Joe didn't need me for hours, but what could I do? The bar around the corner was called Anderson's. She'd know to find me there if she cared to look. All I had to do was stay sober enough to do what needed doing, and hang tough. I drank two beers, staring at the digital clock behind the bar. The fat bartender didn't give two shits as she poured shots to her meager customers and shuffled pints across the wood as chasers. Damn motherfuckers! Some assholes at the other end of the place had been fighting for a while about who would win the finals, going back and forth about the Lakers, Pistons, and Celts. Problem was, the guy who thought the Lakers would win didn't know what kind of trouble that could put him in around here. I got up to walk it off, stepped out of the bar, and turned north on 3rd Avenue. Joe said I'd find his guy in the 20s, on the west side, at Billy's Topless. I knew the place, of course. Not too many sleaze bags like myself who didn't. It wasn't my favorite, but I knew enough guys who made it their afternoon ritual that I'd been in. It took me close to an hour to make my way up and across Manhattan. 
I could have been there sooner, but took it slow. When I got there, around 9.30, I saw they'd changed the sign, just like that. Some city regulations had probably gotten upset about them being topless, and so now Billy had set an awkward S in the middle, so it read Billy's Stopless. Well, good for everyone. None of us were planning to stop. There were guys lined up before the stage, waving dollar bills in front of their face, just like any other night. My guy was sitting at the bar, and he was easy to make. Joe called him Cold War, told me I'd recognize him easy by the Gorbachev birthmark on his forehead. If he didn't have an accent straight off the Staten Island ferry, I might have thought he actually was the old Russian bastard. That, and the fact that he had a mustache, too. Joe says you owe him money. I didn't waste time, just clapped my hand onto his shoulder, cut off his talk with the bartender, and laid it out. That was how Joe liked things done, clean and efficient. That's right. He turned to face me, and my hand fell off him. Had a gut on him. One real nice one. And a white polo shirt with a white Jordache jacket to match. You his piss boy now? This was where I should have hit him, how things were supposed to go. It's just that I hate to break up a good show. The girls on the stage had their G-strings stripped off and had dropped onto their backs to wave their legs open and shut. Who could resist? Maybe I was distracted. Cold War hauled off and hit me in the gut then, and it flashed in my mind that I might not have been the right man for this job. Things with Delilah could have probably predicted that. Then Cold War stood up and took me by the arm, straightened me up to look at him in the eye. He started to say something, but that was when I kneed him in the chestnuts hard enough to hurt one of the girls up on the stage. He gasped and tried to buckle, but I held him up backing him away from the bar and on into the john. Fuck if I had any choice in the matter. Like I said, if I didn't do this to him, next thing there'd be somebody showing up to do it to me. We went into the stall, the two of us, and I backed him into the wall. The toilet was an old one with a tank up above and a long chain to make it flush. I caught Cold War up under his fat chin between his neck rolls and pushed his head back into the porcelain tank. Once I did it, and then again a second time, hard, I saw some blood trickle down behind his ear. "'You hear me now?' I asked him. He nodded. "'I don't care about the money. That's for Joe. What I'm here for is the beating. The money? You get that to Joe. Our business? That's just the blood.' I took the gun from the back of my pants and jabbed it into his stomach hard like it was a knife. I wished it were. Maybe that should have been the tool for this job. I stabbed him again and again with it, and then again, and he tried to double forward. You gonna remember this? I swear I will, he said. I'll get Joe his money. Joe said to make sure you remember. Seems to me like this is something you could forget about in a couple of weeks. Someone tried to come into the bathroom then behind me, and I kicked the door shut. We're not finished, I yelled to the guy and Cold War both. I was getting ideas then, things I wanted to do, ways I could get back at him for all the things I'd got wrong in my life. I thought about hanging him up by the toilet chain, stringing his ass up and pulling it tight around his neck, choking him out long enough to leave a mark. I thought about looping the chain around one of his wrists. Here, I said, let me help you up. I pushed his shoulders back into the wall and punched him in the gut where I'd been jabbing him with the gun. He wheezed and spit blood onto the floor. I hoped I'd caused some internal bleeding, but who could know about things like that? I pried Cold War's arm up from his side and held it over his head, like a referee declaring him the winner in the center of the ring. "'You like this?' I asked. I held the gun under his chin, pushing his face up to look at the hand so he knew what I meant. I looped a toilet chain around his little finger and started twisting it. I had an idea, but didn't know if it would work. Then it started to, and I could tell how much it hurt by how tight he squeezed his eyes shut and the color of the pinky.' His face went red as I kept on twisting the chain. It had bunched up and tightened around the base of his finger. I got a better grip and cranked the handle again. His finger was blue-purple and starting to look like a piece of fruit. I like this, I told him. I like my job. Cold War didn't say anything. He just pleaded at me with his eyes. I figured he had something to say, but couldn't because of how I had the gun pressed into his chin. I pulled it away. Please, he said. You've done enough. You can go home now. Let me go. 
You know I'll pay. I wanted to see him piss himself, but his jeans looked dry, so I kicked him in the nuts. The finger was getting darker. I'm taking this finger with me, I told him, and I cranked the chain again until I felt a pop. He was lucky. The chain had broken first, the handle coming right off from the rest. I looked down at the wooden handle in my palm and then showed it to him. You think this'll do? I asked. He was crying now as he nodded his head. Yeah, I said. I guess it will.